SCP-6200 Insomnium Apocalypses and the death of all humanity are a dime a dozen in the SCP universe. We've seen everything from the planet exploding, to alien invasions, to humanity blinking out of existence in one great moment. Generally, stories involving these situations are more concerned with either the build-up to the event or the event itself, but the one we'll be looking at today concerns the aftermath, with a small amount of survivors trying to deal with what happened. Unfortunately, they'll learn that the danger has not quite passed, and someone still wants them dead. The article begins with a newsletter that was sent out to everyone at Foundation Site 119, announcing a new site department. The new department is the Noospheric Department, as with new and revolutionary technology, they've been approved to begin experimental testing that will allow them to explore and document the entire human psyche. The Noosphere has been brought up several times now in various videos, but to recap, it's essentially the collection of all human thoughts, which is obviously normally inaccessible. The newsletter announces that the site's initial tests with exploring the Noosphere will commence on July 9th, around 10pm. Continuing on to the description, SCP-6200 is an anomalous event that began on July 10th, around 12.12am which resulted in the extermination of the human race. During the event, activity within the Noosphere peaked to record levels, resulting in affected subjects suddenly developing and possessing different physical characteristics and behavior. Only seven researchers are known to have completely avoided the effects of this event, all of them having been involved in the Noospheric tests. The tests involved a new piece of technology that the Foundation had developed, the Noospheric Individual to Collective Emulation Drive, or the NICE Drive. They're not currently sure if the extinction of humanity was related to the Noospheric tests or if it was just a coincidence, but I think that answer will become clear soon enough. Researchers became aware of SCP-6200 following a sudden influx of calls throughout the world to emergency services, in which people reported symptoms of fatigue, queasiness, bodily pain, and paranoia. At the same time, automated hospital systems across the world reported sudden spikes in neural activity in all previously sleeping patients. The Foundation began rationalizing the situation to world governments and attempted de-escalation protocols. Internet activity began surging globally as people continued reporting the symptoms, with multiple social media services experiencing outages due to the activity. Foundation web crawlers were successfully able to archive and delete most of the recorded footage beforehand were provided a transcript of a live stream from a man named Taylor, located within downtown Cincinnati during the event. The footage begins by showing three men in their 20s walking along the street, surrounded by various sounds of laughter and car noises. One of the men asks the others if they have their room key, before stumbling slightly, prompting one of the others to ask if he drank too much. The group laughs, and the man holding the camera, Taylor, says that there's a restaurant up the street that they could stop at, but the others shoot the idea down. Taylor begins moving the camera around to capture the surroundings, prompting one of the others to make fun of him for forgetting to press record one time when they were kayaking in Montana. The group banters some more before one of them, the man that stumbled, is seen grabbing his face and rubbing his eyes, wincing in pain. He complains that he got a migraine out of nowhere, and begins groaning and swaying dramatically as they approach their hotel. The others ask what's wrong with him and if he needs to sit down, but the man can't respond, instead grabbing his head and beginning to scream, dropping to his knees. As he continues to scream, 
Flesh and bone begin to expand from his shoulders, amalgamating into a structure similar to bird wings. The others recoil, asking for an ambulance, as several cars can be heard swerving and crashing nearby. Two of the men move to help the man on the ground, but suddenly they both also drop to their knees, grunting and groaning in pain. Taylor asks what the hell is happening, before dropping his phone and yelling around for help. His friends have gone mute, likely unconscious, and Taylor soon begins to scream as well, as bones begin to protrude from his neck and arms. His skin and eyes are seen to bubble and deform before he faints and falls out of view. Before the Foundation protocols could go into effect to try and contain this, activity within the Noosphere increased rapidly, and within minutes, most of the human population was unconscious. A majority of Foundation personnel also succumbed to the effects, with those protected by anomalous phenomena also being affected albeit at a slower rate. Activity within the Noosphere continued before drastically ceasing at abnormal but consistent levels. Affected subjects were then observed to stand up before performing acts of self-induced morbidity, with closer observations indicating that they were still unconscious during this period. Corpses began to overpopulate the city streets and coastal regions across the planet, with the population quickly plummeting from 7.9 billion to only 100 million. The population continued to dwindle over the course of the following week, as those who were unable to move or were otherwise incapacitated and or incognizant finally perished from natural causes. In the end, only seven researchers inside Site-119 remained alive on the planet. The document continues then, with a log written by one of those seven researchers shortly after the incident, which I'll read verbatim. Recording Log 1 My name is Researcher Zachary Rayner, and the date is, uh, July 11th. It's currently 10.32 a.m., Roughly five and a half hours after Nice Drive, researchers resurfaced from their dive. Of course, we can't really remember anything from that dive. Trying to absorb all the human consciousness would have easily killed us if we tried it. Monitoring teams were supposed to be recording our excursion, but those went offline due to the lockdown. Just our luck. Emergency systems brought us back from the sub-reality layer. Seven researchers are alive and healthy, but the same can't be said for anyone else. The current cause remains unclear. I'm in the process of updating some documentation with notes and information as it comes, although I'm not sure if anyone else will have access to this document. Not even really sure why I'm making a document. <sighs> Old habits, I guess. Everyone else is, well, frightened. We were trained for researching, not for whatever the hell this is. The rest of the group is a bit shaken. Wouldn't be surprised if most of them believed that this was all happenstance, or... You know, whatever else they can think of. I couldn't blame them. What are they supposed to be thinking in a situation like this? But I'm just not as easily convinced. It isn't adding up for me. I mean, the entire world eats shit in a basket, and us seven just happen to be the lucky ones? Yeah, sure. I guess I can't say that. There may be others outside, after all. Though, we've all been too scared to try and find out. It'd probably sound selfish to think us seven were somehow the chosen ones for all this. It's getting late. Or, uh, early, right now. 
should probably get some rest before I lose my chance to. Tomorrow is never promised, right? <laughs> Man, it just sounded like Dad right then. How weird. Anyway, this is my future reminder to stay on track with these notes. Maybe they'll be important someday. Yeah, maybe I'll be able to learn what's going on just before I disappear like everyone else. That's a fun thought. End recording. What follows, then, is the meat of the document. A day-by-day -day log of the seven researchers' activities in the wake of the SCP-6200 event, recorded through the site's security cameras, interspersed with more logs by Rayner. The footage begins in the chamber containing the NICE drives, where the researchers have been connected to them for nearly 30 hours straight. Eventually, automated security protocols initiate a site-wide lockdown, with alarms and flashing lights. The alarms cease after 10 minutes, and a few minutes later, the NICE drive holding researcher Rayner ejects him, at which point he sits up and rubs his eyes, before noticing the flashing lights. He makes his way over to a computer terminal nearby, pressing a number of buttons to deactivate the rest of the NICE drives. Rayner tells the others to stay quiet as they all climb out, and they huddle around the computer terminal. Rayner asks one of the others, Aaron, to try and access the security database to figure out what the alarm is for. Rayner tells them that he was only ejected because the NICE system had a 30-hour time limit, and the others say that they should just sit and wait for a team to pick them up. Rayner counters that he doubts they'll come, because they should have already been here. Several teams, in fact. Aaron finally finds out what happened, labeled as Threat Initiation Code 2004B, meaning that automated systems have detected abnormal changes nearby. Unfortunately, they don't have clearance to learn more, and the team becomes a bit divided about what to do next. Some think they should just stay here and wait for someone to come, while Rayner thinks that they should head to the security office to learn more. Aaron decides that he, Rayner, and another researcher are going to head to the security office, and they'll let them know what's going on using the intercoms. The others are not convinced that they won't die once they head out there, but the three go regardless. Outside the nice chamber, Rayner tells the other two that they should head on to the security office while he's going to the admin offices to check on something. Aaron and the other researcher, Sinclair, find the door to the security office wide open, and Aaron begins accessing the master terminal inside. Soon he brings up a screen showing the motion detector activity within the site, which shows a complete lack of activity for a number of hours. The lockdown seems to be an automated response to the period of inactivity. Aaron could lift the lockdown, but they still might be in danger to whatever caused this issue. Rayner then arrives at the security office, and Aaron tells the others in the nice chamber that there's nothing immediately dangerous. Rayner says that he didn't see anyone in the admin offices, and Sinclair says that it's because they evacuated everyone, as there can't be any other explanation. Aaron looks over the security terminal some more and says that he wouldn't trust going outside, as something's not right. Later, the group of seven gather together in the site cafeteria, with junior researcher Gustum complaining about having to sleep here, as he has a family to take care of back home. Rayner says that he wants to go home as much as everyone else, but right now their priority is figuring out what's happening. They need to avoid making stupid mistakes by being scared. There doesn't seem to be any immediate threat to them in here, so they should settle in and get some rest, figuring out what happened tomorrow. All they know is that something happened and it hit this site, but that's it. There's obviously some dissent among the group, but they all agree to spend the night. 
The next day, Rayner records another personal log, which reads... This is, uh, log two. Nearly 40 hours after NICE members resurfaced. It's almost evening now, and most of us have settled down into whatever space we could find. Everyone was able to rest up and calm down since the dive. Well, calm down somewhat, at least. Still don't really have a clue what's going on. Aaron came to the office I was in earlier. He told me that it was smart of us to stay here. When I asked him why, he showed me all the stuff he compiled from SCIP.net. Logs, recordings, basically everything that he could find. Looks like whatever happened, it really did hit everyone. I went ahead and saved everything I could after Aaron revealed the news to everyone else. With all this extra downtime, I thought I'd try to be productive and figure out what's happening. I managed to snag the director's keycard after Sinclair and Aaron left me alone to head towards the security office. The stupid thing was on the office floor when I found it, practically begging me to pick it up. It was a lucky break. I also managed to search all the offices before I went back to the group. Of course, I didn't really find anything besides old research papers and experiment logs. Oh, right, and a Kit Kat bar stuck between the cushions of a computer chair. Actually, speaking of food, we have plenty of it. Colt went ahead and organized the kitchen for us. Doesn't look like we'll be starving or anything, especially anytime soon. With all the emergency provisions and water, it'll take a couple of months before we have to worry about finding more food. Ah, Jean also stopped by earlier. Said she wanted to talk to me about something. So I'll have to get back to this later, or whenever I can find the time. End recording. Later... Footage shows junior researcher Gustum and researcher Colt sitting in the break room eating together. Gustum asks Colt how he's doing with this whole situation, and he says that he couldn't really say, as he thought about joking earlier that this is just like every typical Wednesday at the Foundation. He says that he couldn't imagine being in Gustum's shoes with a baby back home. The two converse for a bit about children, before Gustum asks Colt about him not seeming to like Rainer that much. Colt sighs and says that he admits that Rainer has talent, but something doesn't feel right with him now. Before all this, he was much more quiet, and while Gustum says that he must just be manning up, Colt says that maybe he's hiding something. Researcher Melissa then appears and tells them to follow her, as something's come up. Meanwhile, Rayner meets with Dr. Jean in one of the offices, who asks him straight out if he has any idea on what's going on with this whole situation. Rayner pauses and shrugs, saying that he doesn't know anything more than what they've already discussed. Jean then asks what they saw in the security office since the site is filled with cameras and motion sensors. Rayner says that it's because they saw nothing that they decided to maintain the site's lockdown, since they didn't see a single soul. Jean then asks about something else, since Rayner slept nearby to Dr. Sinclair last night. She asks if he saw Sinclair walking around early this morning, or heard any knocking or thudding noises. Melissa had been saying something about it, but Rayner says that he didn't see or hear anything. Aaron then calls the two over the intercoms, telling them to come to the security office. In the security office, the entire group of seven gathers together, with Aaron saying that he figured something out, but first, he asks Melissa to repeat what she had said about the noises. Melissa says that she, Gustum, and Jean all heard some noises earlier, something like scratching and knocking. 
Aaron then asks Sinclair if they missed anything in the logs when they first came into the security office, but he says he's not sure, as he left it to Aaron. Aaron then says that he was looking through the logs today, investigating the noises that they heard. When he checked the outside camera feeds before, there was nothing there, but today he found this. He proceeds to bring up a screenshot from one of the outside cameras, showing a group of humanoids with what appear to be bony wings standing on a nearby ridge. The room goes silent, and Aaron says that he has no clue what these things are, but it doesn't look like they're as safe as they thought they were. The following day, the seven sit in the cafeteria, discussing the situation. Aaron says that he saw at least 40 or 50 of those things standing outside of the site, but who knows how many there might be outside of the camera's view, or continuing to show up. Rayner says that they definitely weren't there when they first woke up, although Colt scoffs and says maybe they just weren't looking that hard. Jean interrupts and asks Aaron if the creatures were approaching at all, but Aaron says that if they moved any closer, the perimeter alarm would have gone off. Jean then says that these creatures ruined their opportunity to catch them by surprise by revealing themselves, but also knew exactly how far to come without tripping the alarms. The group falls silent again, with Melissa asking if she's suggesting that these things wanted to be found. Colt says that they might just have good senses, since the perimeter alarm is triggered when someone steps through a strong electromagnetic field outside. Part of the problem is they have no idea what these things are, and they could potentially even be human, although if the site reports are to be believed, they'd be dead humans. Gustum gets upset, as it doesn't seem like they're getting out of here anytime soon, and he storms off. The rest of them agree that all they can really do is wait and see what happens next. Later, Jean and Sinclair meet together in a freight area of the site, with Jean asking him what he thinks of Melissa. She says that Melissa has been acting weird recently, being all quiet and everything. Sinclair agrees that she's been quiet, but not really weird. She's gotten paler over the last few days, but he doesn't think she's been acting any different than everyone else. Jean then says that she caught her hanging around the maintenance panel near her room. Jean couldn't tell what exactly she was doing, but she was definitely messing around with it. Sinclair sighs and says that they're all on edge, and they've all been acting a little differently than they normally would including Jean bringing him in here to gossip. Jean just says that she was curious, and thought she was acting stranger than usual. Meanwhile, Rayner has been viewing all of these security logs, eavesdropping on the other's conversations thanks to his director's keycard. He writes another log two days later, which reads, this is journal log number, uh, what was it, three, four, I've already lost count, three, journal log number three. Been a few days since anything has happened, with the news of us being surrounded by demon monsters, it's, it's been hard to not stress and worry about shit. It's not a huge shock that Gustum and Colt have started to think that all of this is hopeless. Even I'm not sure what to do. Site 119 has been, well, quiet so far. We've been taking turns watching the security feeds outside. Sinclair, Aaron, Jean, and I have each taken shifts so the rest of us can get some sleep. So far, there's been no movement from the things outside. We're suspecting that they're trying to wait us out, see how long we last until we have no choice but to go outside. 
It's actually pretty smart, thinking about it now. We haven't seen them eat or sleep. They might not even need to, especially if they're just, well, corpses. It's a good strategy, all things considered. We'll just need to combat it with a strategy of our own, somehow. I think it's time I start investigating. Everyone here is acting much differently than they used to be. Whether by some sort of fear, anxiety, or whatever, something isn't right. I'm still not convinced that we're innocent of all this. I guess the question is, where do I start? Sinclair? Jean? Is it even any one of those? What if it was Gustum or Aaron? There's just too many unknowns. Not enough information or time. It's getting late, and I have a shift I need to cover for Aaron. I'll have to end the recording here, or until I can find something worthwhile to talk about. Three days later, Aaron and Jean are in the security office together, looking through footage. Nothing has changed with their situation, and Aaron remarks on how, back when he was a kid, his friends and him would play Apocalypse in their backyards, pretending that the world was ending amidst a zombie outbreak. He never would have imagined that he'd be living through an actual apocalypse, especially not in his 30s. Gene asks him if it's not as eventful as he hoped. And Aaron chuckles, saying that he'd be lying if he said he wasn't let down. Gene says that it could be worse, as he could be out there instead of in here. They pause, and then Aaron says that he thinks Gustum was watching Rainer last night. He caught him when he went to use the bathroom, but Gustum just claimed that he left something in Rainer's room. The monitoring system then interrupts the two with a series of loud beeps, and after Aaron investigates, he leaps from his chair, tells her that something's wrong, and they need to leave immediately. Elsewhere, in a storage room, Colt and Melissa are searching for useful supplies, such as blankets and clothes. Colt isn't too convinced that they'll find anything, but says looking here is better than napping in the break room again. He mentions that this reminds him of when he used to work at a retail store, back when he was a teenager. Back when things were simpler. As he's talking, he notices Melissa isn't responding, and starts to look for her throughout the storage room. He eventually finds her on the floor, unresponsive and covered in blood. Her neck contains a large, cylindrical-shaped cavity. And as Colt begins to shout for help, he hears a loud shriek above him. Looking up, he sees one of the winged humanoid creatures clinging to the ceiling, which shrieks again before diving towards him. Colt flees as the sound of snapping metal and shattering wood can be heard behind him. He runs for a short while before turning, clutching a metal pipe that he picked up. As the creature approaches, he swings, smashing the creature in the face and snapping the pipe in half. Holding the broken metal pipe like a spear, he stabs it through the fallen creature's head, causing it to shriek and convulse erratically for several seconds before ceasing. Aaron and Jean then rush in, armed with blunt objects and fire extinguishers, as Colt collapses to the ground in exhaustion. In the aftermath, Rainer writes another log, which reads, Beginning Journal Log 4 Aaron and Jean told us about Melissa sometime after we heard the screeching from one of the storage rooms. Apparently, her and Colt were looking for stuff for us to use. It was sometime during then that Aaron noticed... One of the doors had been opened nearby that sector. One of those... things found a way inside and snuck in. Colt was the only one who survived. 
she never even stood a chance. <sighs> We're all crushed. I can't even imagine what Aaron is going through right now. Poor guy. We've all been giving him some space. None of us have even done anything with her body besides wrapping it in a tarp we found nearby. Guess we're all still just... shocked, I guess. We found the door that the creature came in from. The locking mechanism had been completely shattered from both sides. It was a three-inch steel door, and those monsters were able to break in without making a sound. I've already gone ahead and repaired it the best I could. I also sealed the door just to be safe. Gustum was the last person by that door before things went to shit. What was he doing over there? I mean, someone had to have crushed the door lock somehow. There's no other way to explain how a creature like that could just waltz into a secured facility like this and also avoid the cameras. It's just not possible without someone else's help. Someone from the inside. I'll have to figure this out soon. Otherwise, we all may die before we get a chance. Just like... Just like she did. End recording. The following day, the group gathers in the cafeteria again, when Raynor confronts Gustum about what he was doing near the door before the creature got in. After a 15 second pause, he simply says that he was coming back from storage, and asks how Raynor knew he was over there. Raynor says that he saw him, and expresses disbelief about his story. Gustum says that he heard something, and then saw that the door had been opened, so he shut it and blockaded it before running to the cafeteria. Raynor, however, says that he was in the cafeteria at the time and never saw Gustum, leading Gustum to cuss him out and say that he went and hid in the bathroom because he swore something was chasing him. Aaron stops their arguments, and after a short pause, Gustum says he needs to use the restroom and leaves. Aaron says that they need to figure out how to secure this place before any more of the creatures get in, so Raynor says that he could seal off some of the doors, and Sinclair says that they could lock out more of the site that they don't use, such as the iconography division. Colt asks if they're sure that the creature is fully dead, and Jean confirms that she took some gasoline and a blowtorch and burned it to ash. This surprises Rainer, as they could have tested it, but Jean says that she saved some skin tissue and bone samples. Colt accuses her of trying to hide and withhold evidence to cover herself, but Jean says that all of the samples are free for anyone to research. So far, she hasn't found anything useful, other than confirming that they're definitely human. Aaron then leaves abruptly, and Raynor says that he'll go talk to him. He meets with him in the security office, although Aaron knows why he's here, and assures him that he's perfectly fine. Melissa had been Aaron's wife, so the others are worried about him. Raynor says that he's strong and tough, but it's okay to not be strong, too. He tells him to have faith and they'll be all right. Later, in the break room, Jean sits near Sinclair, who asks her if they're going to do another interrogation. He says that if she's going to ask him a bunch of questions, she might as well tell him what she needs the information for. She says it's not an interrogation this time, she just wants to talk to him about Colt. She thinks it's strange that both he and Melissa were in the storage room, but she died and he made it out with not much more than a few scratches. Sinclair says that things happen, 
but she replies that they both know that Colt isn't acting like someone innocent. They know that someone messed with that door beforehand, and it could have only been Colt or Gustum. Sinclair says that they don't know if any of that is true, and besides, they're all scared and worried, so it's not the time to get conspiratorial. Two days later, Rayner writes another log, which reads, It's been a few days since I recorded one of these. I've been thinking a lot about our current circumstances. Looking back through these logs, Coulter's right when he said we were trapping ourselves in here. Now we're surrounded by things we can't quite comprehend or understand. It starts to take a toll on you after a while. All of us here are suffering from it. At first, it was just boredom. Sitting in some lousy sight all day with nothing to do. But now it's all just... dark things. Especially with one of us gone now. We're all starting to get suspicious of each other. It's not a secret that someone is trying to get us all killed. Whether it be intentional or incidental, it doesn't matter now. I myself have my own suspicions. Gustum or Colt, it has to be either of them. Hell, maybe both at this point. You don't just linger by some door before a breach happens. That's just begging to be caught. Especially since no one else could have done that while he was there. Not unless they were some sort of superhero or something. Beyond all that, though, there hasn't been much else to update on. The creatures outside still haven't budged an inch. I don't think any of them has slept or ate anything since they showed up here. <laughs> what in the hell is making them do this? Are they sentient? Are they being... Controlled by something? There are just... So many questions. And so little time. I'll have to ask Jean what she's seen so far from her samples in the lab. Maybe I could find a clue, too. From the samples... Or from her. Whichever comes first. Rayner then approaches Gustum in an office, saying that he wanted to check up on him. Gustum says that he's fine, and he's just got a lot of things going on in his mind. Rayner apologizes for accusing him in the cafeteria, as they're all struggling. Sometimes they have to remind each other that they aren't alone, as communication is important. As Rayner begins to leave, Gustum asks him if he thinks that his daughter is alright, and Rayner says that he thinks she'll be just fine, because if they can make it out alive, so can anyone else. A few days later, Rayner writes another log, which reads, We held a service for Melissa today. Sinclair and I were able to fully cover her up with some more tarps. We had everyone come join around her once Sinclair and I finished to speak our final words to her. It was... quiet. No one felt like saying much, if anything. Aaron tried to get some words out, but he stopped midway in the session to go back to the security office. I can't blame him. Not after seeing her like that. We couldn't find a furnace or anything big enough to cremate her. Can't say we would have known what to do if we found anything like that. The smell was getting so bad that we had to throw her remains in a trash chute and eject it to the dumpster outside. It was a risky move, especially with all the creatures nearby, but... It was better than leaving her body to rot in one of the spare office rooms. Colt's been more and more suspicious lately. 
I tried talking with him earlier, and he was always trying to find an excuse to walk away. I was able to take a look in his room. Didn't find much. No weapons, no suspicious items. It was completely clear. Either he knows what he's doing and he's keeping it all in some other place, or Colt is innocent. But I don't think that's the case. Not for him, or for Gustum. Jean will be the next one on my chopping block. Especially after her recent behavior with Aaron and Sinclair. She thinks she's safe from prying eyes. She doesn't have a clue that I can watch her, after all. Either way, I'm going to get to the bottom of this all. Even if it kills me. I don't have anything else to report, though. I'll go ahead and end this log here. Sixteen days after they woke up, Jean is seen walking through the hallways, yelling for Gustum to come get some food in the cafeteria. She eventually finds him in an office, slumped over the desk with a pool of blood. She turns his chair and sees a knife pierced through his chest. She drops to her knees in shock and then begins to frantically search the area before racing outside and screaming for help. Apparently, Gustum had seen some footage taken from security cameras in his home in Indiana. The footage shows what happened to Gustum's infant daughter, although the specifics are removed from the log, as Rayner remarks that he doesn't think anyone else needs to see that. The following day, he writes another log, which reads... Beginning log... Uh, whatever. Now. The current time is roughly 5.30 in the afternoon, and... Well, it looks like things are getting worse for us. Gustum is gone. Gustum and Melissa Bolt. He was able to access the security cameras in his home. That was all it took for him, I think. Just one frame. Everything inside of me wants to say it isn't real, but... We all saw the knife in his chest. At the very least, he didn't go out from a surprise attack or anything. He knew what he wanted and I hope he has some closure now, wherever he is. The funeral service was short. We didn't spend any time with last words. We just dumped the body out of the chute again. I'm starting to get worried that those chutes will fill up if we aren't careful. The last thing we need is a bunch of trash and corpses overflowing out into the hallways. Talk about a nightmare. <clears throat> if Colt doesn't fess up, my next target will definitely be Jean. She's been hiding all of her evidence. I think she has something incriminating somewhere in her room. I wouldn't even need anything specific. Just something that I can pin this all down to. If she's not the culprit, well... That could only mean it's Aaron. And I don't even want to think about that. I'll maybe try tomorrow or here in a couple of days to see if I can't dig up something useful. Something's got to give in. Eventually. In the security office, Sinclair and Aaron are monitoring the camera feeds outside, although nothing can be seen. Sinclair says that it all just doesn't feel real and mentions that he attended a Foundation seminar once led by Dr. Placeholder McDoctorate, which was meant to be a sort of test to see if people were interested in the field. The seminar was about there being another dimensional plane, a narrative plane, in which deific beings sat around and wrote all of them into a grand story. Sinclair says that he was more curious than intrigued, as the last thing he needs is an existential crisis on the job. 
Sinclair asks Aaron if he also has been in the field, and Aaron confirms that he was an equipment engineer for some of the mobile teams for a while. They both then agree that Gustum's stab wound was not self-inflicted, and whoever did it must have waited until he was distracted to jump on him. Sinclair says that it's possible that Jean did it, since she was the one who found him, but it could have been anyone with a clearance card, as they could have wiped the camera feeds. He also says that Rainer's been up to something as well, and Aaron asks why he's discussing all of this with him. Sinclair says that he believes Aaron to be the least likely suspect, given that his wife died, so he trusts him. Aaron chuckles that he could be making a mistake there, but Sinclair simply says that it'd be his funeral if he is. A few more days go by, until Rainer quietly enters one of the offices and begins rummaging through the filing cabinets there. He doesn't seem to locate what he's looking for, and canvasses the rest of the room, searching across every paper and document there. Still unsuccessful, he returns everything back to where it was, and then accesses the computer there. He searches through the various files on the computer, until voices can be heard outside of the office, at which point he quickly stands, shuts down the computer, and leaves. A few more days later, he writes another log, which reads, The plot thickens. I think I caught Jean. Took a peek at her room while everyone was busy. I tried to find something physical, a weapon or something, anything that I could tie back to Gustum or Melissa. When none of that worked, I went ahead and logged onto her computer. I wasn't able to find much since people were coming, but I did notice a secret folder. I didn't have time to use my clearance to void the password, so I couldn't see what was all in it. Looks like I'll have to go back at another time and see if I can't access it. I'm hoping there's a USB or something nearby so I can copy what I find in there and post it somewhere else to view. This is big news. Finally, I may have something concrete. It might even link Gene and Colt together. Hell, maybe even Aaron. Gene is hiding something from everyone, and when I get my hands on it, when I get my hands on it, she'll regret it. I'll make sure of it. Hopefully I have a chance tomorrow. She isn't on any shift, but she will be downstairs in the lab for a few minutes. That'll be my opportunity to sneak back in and copy that data. Wish me luck. Later, in a hallway, Rainer is seen heading towards the same office from before, but just as he is about to open the door, Colt calls out to him, asking to chat. He wanted to apologize for how he's acted towards Rainer, as it's been bothering him since Gustum asked him about it. Rainer tells him that it's alright, and Colt walks off as Rainer enters the office. Inside, he plugs a USB drive into the computer, and begins to copy the secret documents. He mutters to himself about Colt not being safe yet, and then notices that a number of the files concern each one of the other survivors. Rainer says to himself that either Jean had a plan, and then hears Jean's voice from behind him say that she was looking for something. Rainer leaps from the chair, and demands to know what all this is. Jean responds that she's just keeping tabs on things, and points out that some of the files there she doesn't even have clearance for. She asks him if he thinks she's some sort of psychopathic monster, and he says it's possible, as there used to be seven of them, and someone is the reason that they're down to five. Anyone could be guilty, and they can't afford to take risks. She asks him if that's why he decided to snoop around on his own, and he responds that he just doesn't know who he can trust. She says that they can't just both keep snooping around on their own, as they're meant to be a team, 
so she'll tell him what she knows if he does the same. Rayner says that he'll tell her once he compiles everything, but he mentions to himself that he's not sure if this is a good idea, but this is what he gets for trying to be the hero. The following section takes place over an SCP messaging client that Rayner and Jean use to communicate. Jean asks why they're using this when it would be easier to just meet up and share notes. Rayner counters that it's easier to just upload documents on here to share them. Despite this, Rayner admits that he hasn't really found out anything damning, but his key suspects before this were her and Colt. Jean finds this humorous, as she thought it was him or Sinclair. She used to think Colt might be responsible, but she just thinks he's a blunt person. Neither of them suspect Aaron, partly due to how vigilant he's been in the security office and partly due to losing his wife. Rayner sends her what information he has, revealing that he has the director's keycard, which he found on the floor initially. After reading through it all, Jean mentions that she had been looking through the old drafted proposal for the Noosphere test that they were involved in, and noticed that it talked about another study, Project Parasite. Rayner doesn't think it was that important, just some other precursor experiment that helped form the project, but he looks into it with the director's clearance. He finds an SCP document for another anomaly that's since been marked as neutralized. The anomaly is an abandoned home in Arizona that's now a nesting ground for a developing species of anomalous organisms. These organisms are comparable to that of ordinary parasites, but when threatened, they will revert to a large biped creature typically possessing wings or other appendages suited for hunting. While they appear to be human, they differ drastically in behavior, composition, and dietary patterns. Increased predatory drive and nocturnal tendencies cause them to travel away from the house for food, often until daytime. They are strictly carnivorous, with aptitudes toward human and animal flesh despite being capable of eating plant life and other foods. Current theories regarding these entities suggest that all of them are part of a singular consciousness, and they manifest once transferring themselves onto active humans via parasitic subagent, terminating their hosts through a variety of methods to assume full control. While this sounds incredibly similar to what's going on in the world right now, Rayner asks why she's so interested in it. She just asks him to bring up any other files related to it, so he pulls up an addendum. The addendum explains that the house was first discovered in 1981, following a large spike in missing persons, and in mid-1984 it was discovered that the entities are sentient, with the ability to speak standard English. They managed to get an interview with one, which we'll get to, but they have since refused to speak with Foundation personnel otherwise. It was later learned that they are capable of advanced communication via collective consciousness, which later allowed Foundation personnel to understand current theories regarding the existence of the Noosphere. Controlled studies continued until 2019 when the anomaly was terminated to save Foundation research teams from succumbing to the anomaly. Investigations of dead entities indicate that these creatures are composed entirely of anomalous, parasitic insects. Parasites are capable of altering their physical bodies, conjoining with other parasites to form one organism, which can then infect and terminate humans. After killing them, the parasites can ingest all of the dead tissue, altering themselves again to replicate the previous looks and physical characteristics of the deceased individual. The parasites are unable to assume full control until their hosts are terminated. In the interview, 
A Foundation doctor asks the Entity's leader why they're here, but the Entity responds that it wouldn't matter to bugs like them, and to leave them alone. He then asks why they stay here in this little house, to which the Entity responds that they want seclusion, the family that they have made. The doctor asks the Entity if it cares a lot about them but the Entity insists that there's no need for it to answer this question. It tells him that if the humans take a wrong step towards them, they won't hesitate to squash them all like ants. The Doctor asks one more question, on why they take control of humans' bodies instead of just consuming them. The Entity chuckles and says that they have little patience for humans, but nonetheless, they humor them. They find all of the humans disgusting, but then it transforms into a humanoid figure and says that it's just easier to hunt your prey when they don't have to be afraid of the hunter in front of them. Jean says that this is all interesting, as these parasitic creatures could morph and shift to create and make other appendages, and they were attracted to human hosts. The tissue and bone samples from the entity they killed showed that the extra bone and flesh was slightly different from the main body, but the tissue was entirely human flesh, with no microscopic organisms present. It doesn't seem like the entities they're dealing with and the entities from this document are exactly the same. When she asks Rainer why the anomaly was decommissioned, he brings up a video feed showing an MTF rushing into the house after a research team called for immediate aid. The team kicks down the front door, and a firefight immediately ensues between the team and the entities inside. One of the team, who was distracted while trying to help a wounded researcher, is pounced on by an entity, who digs its wings into their chest, piercing through their ribcage and vital organs. The battle continues, as another agent is grabbed by an entity who slams them into the ground, instantly snapping their neck. The rest of the team decides to retreat, saving the one researcher they can, the same that previously interviewed the entity's leader. One of the team holds their ground to let the other agent escape with the researcher, dying in the process. Before the last agent makes it out, however, he's attacked by another entity, managing to stab it through the skull with his knife. Unfortunately, the researcher had lost too much blood from his mutilated leg, and perished shortly after. The house was subsequently destroyed, along with the remaining entities. Jean asks Rainer if he knows how many of them worked in the field before joining the NICE project, but he doesn't. She then just tells him to meet her tomorrow in the security office because she may be onto something. She tells him to bring only Aaron with him, but she needs to check on something first. The two disconnect from the chat, and the following day, Rainer is approached by Sinclair on his way to the security office. Sinclair says that he knows that Rainer and Jean are up to something, as they've been both acting skittish recently. Rainer just says that nothing is going on, they're just both trying to understand everything that's happening. Sinclair says that whatever they're doing, the others can obviously see that they're up to something, so maybe they should just let everyone know before they get too suspicious. Sinclair then walks off as Rainer stands there momentarily before continuing on. Speaking of suspicious, security footage shows Colt sneaking around behind the security office, listening in on Rainer, Jean, and Aaron, while taking notes in a notebook. Inside of the security office, Rainer and Jean fill Aaron in on everything they've learned, at which point he asks what it all means, and why they're asking for his help. Gene asks about that video of the MTF, asking how many of the people on the NICE project used to be part of an MTF. Aaron says that there were three, himself, 
Sinclair, and Colt. The point that Jean is trying to make is that if these things are parasites, and they had infected one of the MTF agents in that raid, and that agent ended up joining the NICE project and getting hooked up to the entire human noosphere, it's possible that they could have infected every human on Earth. The parasites may have known that they were about to be wiped out, and hid inside of that person until a solution revealed itself. They wouldn't be able to physically infect everyone through the noosphere, but they could potentially alter every person's consciousness to make people believe that they were infected, which would alter their bodies in turn. The parasites only work if the host is dead so whoever is killing them is doing so specifically to convert them. They just don't know who it is, but it's likely Sinclair or Colt. Aaron asks why they don't just confront them directly and put a stop to this, but Raynor says that they can't blow their cover yet, they just need to wait for the killer to slip up. For now they need to lay low and let the killer approach them. The following day, Aaron is sitting in the security office with Colt, who asks him how much he really trusts Rainer and Jean. Aaron says that he doesn't know, and Colt says that they've both been scurrying along, pinning things on everyone and pointing fingers, and it's kind of concerning. He thinks that they've been giving out false information and trying to spread it so that all of the heat goes off them. He confesses that he watched them do exactly that to Aaron yesterday, and he's sure that he and Sinclair will be next. He doesn't know what they were talking about, but something is fishy, and he asks Aaron to not put his entire trust in them. Meanwhile, in the cafeteria, Jean flinches as Sinclair sits near her, and she remarks that she's just jumpy today. Although Sinclair presses her on if anything's wrong, she insists that she's fine, so he instead asks if she's learned anything about the entity they killed. She says only that it's human, and it's hard to analyze the sample when the site has such little inventory. He then asks her about her investigation, and she just says that she's getting somewhere, and hopes that it leads to something. She then smiles faintly before standing and leaving. Later, in an office, Raynor asks Jean why these monsters would be attacking them like this, but Jean isn't sure there's a good reason, other than perhaps revenge. She says that the biggest lesson she's learned in the Foundation is that they're hardwired to understand what's happening around them as it makes them comfortable to know the odds and ends of systems they can't control. Sometimes, though, you have to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations, and be content with not understanding things. She then replays the footage from the raid, focusing on the surviving MTF member, but they can't figure out who it might be. Rainer then says that if they're certain that the parasites found their way into the noosphere, because someone was a physical host for them, then there could be some sort of deformations or inconsistency with someone in their group. It could be something that they wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye, but perhaps with a different camera filter. They decide to rush into the security office to give it a try. Inside the office, they find Aaron, and tell him that they need to use the computer to try and find the culprit. Using the director's keycard, they can access the different camera filters, and use a thermal filter to look at the cafeteria. They see two red spots appearing together, one of which is significantly darker than the other. Looking closer, the dark red spot is actually a bunch of little things. The lighter red object is Colt, and the darker collection is Sinclair, or what used to be Sinclair. Jean decides that they need to grab some weapons and confront him now, 
otherwise he could very well kill Colt before they stop him. Aaron tells them to go ahead, saying that he has a plan and they need to trust him. The other two are hesitant, but go on. In the cafeteria, Sinclair mentions that Colt told him about his brother that died in a car accident a while back, and he says that he knows it's not easy dealing with stuff like that. Colt says not to worry about it, as they have bigger fish to fry. Sinclair then gets up and moves behind Colt, putting a hand on his shoulder, saying that they're all in the same boat, and they're going to get through this. He's interrupted by Rainer and Jean, who approach the table calmly. They say that everything's alright, but they need to borrow Colt for a bit, as Aaron said he needed some help. Colt begins to stand, as Sinclair's hand has not left his shoulder, and Sinclair then notices a gun in Rainer's pocket, asking him where he found it. Rainer just says he found it hidden in a drawer, and as Colt gets up to move, Sinclair stops him. Colt says that he's been meaning to talk with them anyway, but Sinclair chuckles and says that after all of this, he doesn't notice that they're suddenly armed and asking for him to go to Aaron for some suspicious sounding help. Jean says that Aaron needed some help fixing some frayed wires, as Rainer slowly moves his hand towards his gun. Sinclair tells Colt that they're suspecting him of being the killer, and tightens his grip on his shoulder. Colt tells Sinclair to let him go, at which point Jean pulls out her gun and points it at Sinclair, demanding he let him go. Sinclair sighs heavily and says that they figured something out, and it's a shame. He then squeezes Colt's shoulder hard enough to break the bone, causing him to howl in pain, and Rainer pulls his gun out as well. Sinclair continues to crush Colt's shoulder, at which point he turns and punches him in the face, tearing bits of flesh and bone from his cheek. The wound shifts as a large number of small organisms move and close the gap, leaving no mark of the impact. His face then deteriorates as loud snapping and crunching sounds can be heard, and large wings form from his back. Talons and spikes begin to grow from his hands, arms, and legs, and blood begins to pour from Colt's shoulder, causing him to scream louder. Sinclair says that he wanted to have some more fun with them, as they really are quite peculiar little things, much less like the bugs he saw them as before. He then lifts Colt off of the ground by his broken shoulder, causing more screams, and squeezes harder. He then grabs Colt's throat, swiftly snapping his neck before tossing the corpse aside. Gene and Rainer finally open fire on the entity, as outside the sound of banging and clawing can be heard along the walls, and the perimeter alarms go off. The entity grabs a table and flings it at the two, managing to hit Rainer and send him backwards. Jean continues to fire upon it, to little effect, and it begins moving towards her. Soon, Jean runs out of bullets, and she throws the gun at the entity, missing. It then steps on her left arm, and just as it's about to attack her, Rainer fires off some more shots, distracting it. It grabs a chair with its wing and flings it at Rainer, hitting him again. As it's about to attack Jean, however, a loud gunshot is heard from behind it, and as it turns, another gunshot strikes it in the face, knocking it off of Jean. Aaron appears, carrying a shotgun, and he proceeds to fire several more times at the entity, bringing it to the ground. He continues firing until out of ammo at which point the entity is unresponsive. Outside, the sounds of banging and clawing cease entirely, and Aaron says that he was just waiting for his opportunity to surprise it. Jean's arm is injured, and Rainer is disoriented, but okay. Unfortunately, they didn't end up saving Colt. 
they now notice that the banging sounds outside have stopped, although they're not exactly sure why. Back in the security office, they look at the outdoor camera feeds, which show a large number of creatures lying motionless on the ground. It would seem that they're all well and truly dead, and Rayner guesses that maybe since the parasites masquerading as Sinclair were the last physical ones of their kind, the rest died off with him. They're not sure what to do now, but Aaron says that he has one idea and he lifts the security lockdown on the site. He suggests they take the risk and go outside. Afterwards, Rayner writes one more log, alongside Jean, in which they state that it's been almost 30 days since they awoke from the project, and since then they've lost all but three personnel, not counting the previous Dr. Sinclair who they later realized was not the actual doctor. Jean explains that after some investigation into Sinclair and the Project Parasite precursor study, they eventually learned that he had been compromised by a parasitic anomaly. The parasite was able to then transfer itself into the noosphere along with the rest of them, presumably infecting it and the rest of all human perception, aside from the six other researchers. They're still not sure why though, and they'll definitely need to spend more time trying to piece it all together. Rayner also alludes to a budding relationship between himself and Jean, but she tells him there are more important things they need to worry about. All of the entities have completely vanished, and their best guess is that Sinclair was the primary anomaly, and wasn't able to transfer himself to another host before dying. Their next task then is to turn things back to normal, and Jean hopes that there's a solution that doesn't turn them into lab rats or corpses as soon as they return things back to the way they were. Rayner says their options are to try to live things out and hope for the best, or they could jump ship, or find some anomaly that can turn back time, or switch realities. That's their plan then and they both decide there isn't much point in keeping logs anymore, ending the recording. First of all, SCP-2000 is generally the first thought when it comes to resetting the world, but it doesn't necessarily exist in every canon, or the group might just not know about it, at least not yet. This is an apocalyptic murder mystery, which doesn't happen too often where the characters can't really even think too much about what happened to wipe out humanity because they have to deal with who is wiping out the last seven. Obviously, it would be very easy for the entities to break in and slaughter the last seven, but the entire plot is predicated on the fact that the leader of the entities enjoys playing with its prey, wanting to drag this out much like a game. Whether the remaining three end up finding a way to reset things, or whether they end up living out their lives together before the true extinction of humanity, is up in the air. There's also the matter of thousands of other anomalies that are left unchecked, even if the entities manage to kill a number of the ones that can be killed. Either way, I always appreciate a good murder mystery, even if the ones set in the SCP universe tend to be pretty unique. 